Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the March session of our 2022-23 CIDR session series from the Canadian Initiative for Distance Education in partnership with the International Review of Research in Open and Distributed Learning and the Centre for Distance Education, Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at Athabasca University. For today's session, we're pleased to welcome back two of our most consistent supporters of CIDR, Drs. Michael Barber and Randy Labonte, with for the latest installment of their ongoing mini-series of State of the Nation reports on Canadian K-12 online learning. Dr. Michael Barber is Director of Faculty Development and Professor of Instructional Design for the College of Education and Health Sciences at Turo University, California. He has been involved with K-12 online and blended learning in a variety of countries for two decades as a researcher, teacher, course designer, and administrator. Dr. Randy Labonte is CEO of Can e Learn, a not-for-profit society promoting student success and providing leadership in online and blended learning, and adjunct professor at Vancouver Island University in online learning and teaching for K-12 educators, shifting practices to online learning environments. Together, they're researchers and advocates for policies designed to promote effective K-12 online and blended learning, with a particular interest in rural and remote learners, and a passion that has now carried their State of the Nation series of reports into its 15th year. So I'm now passing the microphone to Michael and Randy. Everyone, welcome Drs. Michael Barber and Randy Labonte. Thank you very much, Dan. I appreciate the uh, appreciate the introduction. Let me just share my screen here let's see i want to share a specific window there we go cider and you, know, you all disappeared so i've got to find that little button you told me to there we go i think that does it all right perfect so um, welcome everyone. I'm Mike Barber. My colleague Randy Labonte is uh, with me here once again and uh, we are presenting our latest edition of the State of the Nation Research Project. Um, as uh, Dan mentioned, um, we have been doing this for 15 years and each year when I update this particular uh, graphic, uh, I'm always a little bit both amazed that we continue to keep doing this uh, as well as a little impressed about the fact that, you know, we've got this this wonderful collection of, of uh, items here and um, I'm looking around the room and noticing that uh, many of the, the things that we've been able to accomplish with this are actually uh, the responsibility of, of some of the folks in the room. Um, in particular, I noticed Adrian was in the room uh, earlier and he was the, uh, you know, when you see the changeover from the solid uh, color on the top and the Canadian flag underneath to the uh, maple leaf that, that sort of goes, uh, that was uh, Adrian's uh, creative uh, talents that uh, got us a, a new cover because Open School BC at the time um, started actually in 2012. Um, along with INACO, they were jointly publishing that uh, fifth one, and then in the sixth one, it was just Open School BC, and uh, uh, Adrian uh, wanted to take on the, the cover. He uh, uh, wanted to update it, and as you can see, we used that uh, uh, some version of that for quite a number of years, so I want to thank him for that. Yeah. And um, so uh, speaking of thanks, um, obviously I want to uh, thank our sponsors that uh, help us put together this report every year. Uh, without this group of uh, supporters in all honesty, I suspect Randy and I would have given up this endeavor long ago, um, or at least um, given up this particular report. I suspect we'd still be doing this kind of work, uh, just not this specific report. Um, so you can see our, our sponsors here and we thank them uh, for that because it allows us both to uh, invest the time as well as the um, particularly the the travel trying to get the word out after the reports have been done each year uh, so that folks are familiar with it because uh, uh, not everyone is as good as cider in terms of being able to present online so oftentimes you've got to beat the bushes in person um, 
If you've never been or if this is your first time coming across the report, uh, if you go to the website k12soTn state of the nation dot ca, uh, that's our project website, and you'll find uh, all fifteen reports there. Uh, the one that he seems to get the most hits is this data and information link, the third one across the top. Uh, because what that has is it has each of the provinces done individually. So that's where you'll find a much more detailed profile for each of the provinces, as well as links into all of the previous profiles from the uh, 15 years worth of reports there. So you can also see how an individual jurisdiction has changed over time. Um, the responses to the individual program survey are found there. Uh, so it's really sort of your one stop shop on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis to uh, find everything that you're looking for. Um, so basically, as, as Dan said, we've been doing this for 15 years and we followed our, a, a pretty consistent methodology throughout most of that period with maybe the exception of the very first year uh, when we did an abbreviated introductory report. Um, so we'll send a survey to each of the ministries and departments of education across the country. Uh, that'll usually go out sometime in June or early July. Uh, most of them never respond until whatever we set as the deadline sometime in October or November. Um, we try to encourage them to respond earlier, and some actually do, uh, because oftentimes we want to, we've got some follow-up questions, particularly if there's things that have changed uh, in their jurisdiction. Um, oftentimes we'll come across things that are published on their websites or things that we get from the media, uh, both in terms of their reporting as well as the, Randy and I have developed a, a good, con, a, a good, I guess, list of contacts in the media over the years around this topic. So oftentimes um, as they get documents that maybe uh, were given to them, uh, they'll be shared with us so that uh, oftentimes they'll ask us for, you know, to break it down for them or to, to comment on them. Uh, so we get access to those types of things. Um, in addition, particularly once we brought Canny Learn into the fold, uh, which would have been about 10 years ago, um, our ability to contact specific individuals that really have their thumb on what's happening on the ground in each of the jurisdictions has increased significantly. Um, and, uh, you know, that that network that we've got there, those folks are, are primarily practitioners in many cases. They're they're leaders of online programs or folks that have been involved uh, in a practitioner sense for in, in many cases, as long as Randy and I have been involved in this. Uh, the two other things that we often do are, are individual program surveys. And then from those program surveys, we might do follow up interviews on those. Um, so in terms of, of the ministry responses and, and where we get a lot of our data, uh, as you can see, this is the last five years of data collection. And for the most part, you'll see that each year we tend to get a response from the ministry, although it varies from year to year. So some years they're, they'll actually meet the deadline. Other years they won't we'll have to rely upon folks on the ground. Um, in some years they'll choose not to do it because they've been upset with something that we've written the previous year, uh, which happens more than you would think um, for a publication like this. Um, you would think that would be something that shouldn't be the case. Um, and then in some cases, the folks just don't have the ability to uh, provide up to date data. And I'll, I'll point to Ontario as a good example of this. So. Um, when we make the request in June of this year um, for the data for this school year, the 2022-23 school year, even though we might not get a response until the fall of 23, so as basically, you know, November of 23, early December of 23, so as the calendar year 23 is ending, as we're already two or three months into the 23-24 school year, the most recent data that they will have available uh, that they will be able to certify was from the 21-22 school year. Uh, so the data we get from Ontario in most cases is at least one school year old compared to what we're looking at. And this year um, it was two school years old, unfortunately. Um, and um, so moving on to the individual program surveys, um, as you can see, we don't get a lot of these on an annual basis, at least we haven't since COVID. Um, prior to the uh, addition or to the, I guess the, I was going to say the addition of COVID, but COVID really wasn't an addition, it was something that was sort of happened to us. 
Um, but prior to COVID, um, we used to get a much better response. And um, you can see there are some jurisdictions there that we, we um, get higher numbers from. If you look at the number of programs that we've heard from throughout the history of this, so folks we've heard from at least once since we started doing the individual program surveys, many of which we've heard from multiple times, even if we haven't heard from them in the current year, uh, as you can see, we have a much better response rate across the board. Uh, the one jurisdiction that I'll point out as being sort of an outlier to that uh, is Manitoba. Um, in Manitoba, most years we might hear from one or two individual uh, programs. And as you can see, we've only ever heard from nine of them in the entire time we've been doing uh, this uh, particular study. So looking at, um, I guess, the, the, the results or the data, um, in terms of how online programs are regulated across the country, uh, you'll see um, really there are sort of four main ways in which it happens. Um, many of them have legislation, although that's kind of misleading, uh, with the exception of Nova Scotia and uh, BC. In most cases, that checkmark for legislation is usually a single sentence that says, the Minister of Education shall have the authority to regulate distance education and legislative reference to distance learning um, in the entire you know, Schools Act or Education Act. Um, in the case of Nova Scotia, they actually, it's part of the, there's a, a section uh, related to distance learning in the collective agreement that they have with the Nova Scotia Teachers Union. And in order for that to come into force, it has to be passed as an act. Um, so that's where the uh, legislative language comes from in Nova Scotia. Uh, in the case of BC, uh, there's always been a section of the uh, Schools Act and a section of the Independent Schools Act that details a, a fairly structured regulatory environment that they have. Um, beyond that, you'll see there's a lot of places that will just issue a policy handbook and say that you have to follow this. In some cases, they'll have both the policy handbook and written agreements that the individual programs have to sign on to um, in order to operate. And then in the case of the territories, as well as um, the provincial virtual collegiates that exist in Manitoba, uh, those are all done through memorandums of understanding. Um, looking at the, the types of programs we've got, um, this chart is one that you would have seen in each of the reports, and it's evolved over the years in terms of the colors for each of the provinces, um, in some cases going back and forth. Um, between two uh, at different times, but this is likely the last year we're going to use this uh, because it's becoming less and less useful in terms of describing the complexity of what's happening throughout the uh, throughout the country. Um, so as you can see, most of Atlantic Canada have single province-wide programs. Uh, we say it's a single province-wide program in New Brunswick. It's actually two. Uh, there's a single Anglophone program. Um, Pro, uh, program and there's a single francophone program. Um, as you can see throughout most of Western Canada, it's primarily district-based programs um, and uh, the same with Ontario. Uh, in Manitoba, you've got those two provincial virtual collegiates that exist as well as there was an elementary program that was set up during COVID, which uh, at least is operating um, last school year, which is when this report would have been looking at the 21-22 school year. It's also operating this year, although it's been announced that it's going to be closing. Um, the territories still use a lot of uh, programming from uh, the southern provinces, although both um, the Yukon is in year six, I believe it is, with their Aurora Institute, uh, Aurora Virtual School, sorry, uh, and the um, Northwest Territories has been using um, the Beaufort Delta Education Council has had an online program there, and they're in year five of that, uh, which I think is the last year of their pilot phase. Uh, so they'll be um, expanding that come next year. So that's why they're kind of red striped. Uh, the only one I didn't mention was Quebec, and Quebec is a little bit of an outlier because um, for the most part, with the exception of the Anglophone program LEARN, uh, most of the distance learning that's taken place in Quebec has been the correspondence model that's been offered through uh, SOFED, uh, which is primarily for students that 
uh, have left the traditional brick and mortar school environment um, and um, are learning in sort of an independent learning center um, is the, the way it's set up. One of the reasons why this chart is becoming less and less useful every year is simply because of the, the complexity. So if you take, say, um, Ontario as an example, um, Ontario is blue, and which indicates primarily district based programs and the actual management of the online programs there are at the school board or district level. Um, but the learning management system and all of the online course content uh, is provided by the ministry. So it's a province wide thing. In addition to that, they also have the independent learning center, uh, which has always been, you know, it's got almost a hundred year history now of operation. And uh, since the Ford government announced their um, optional mandatory two graduation or two courses, online courses for graduation requirement, um, the independent learning center has had a much greater focus at a provincial level. Um, in BC, prior to the current school year, so basically the the period of time that's actually covered by this report, you had a, most of the school districts throughout the province had online programs or were collaborating with a, a neighbor to, to run an online program, but most of them also operated at a provincial level. So while the management of the program was at the district level, most of them could and, and did enroll students throughout the province. Now, in some cases, it was a very small number. Um, you know, so while we describe it as a district based program, they're district based programs that have provincial scopes. Um, so it, it, we're going to have to come up with a, a different way of sort of trying to get at this information. And uh, I, I spend a bit of time on it because I'm always welcome to ideas as Randy and I uh, take the next. Well, I guess the next one will be released in November or December of the coming year. So we've got basically about uh, eight or nine months to come up with some ideas as to how we can uh, still portray this kind of information, but be able to do it with the complexity that it deserves. Um, so looking at the type of activity that we've had across the country, um, as you can see here, um, we've had almost 400,000 uh, students that we know of that uh, are engaged in online learning. And I say that we know of um, because you'll see there's a number of tildes or approximates on that. And I mentioned the caveat that while this is for the 2020-21 school year, um, actually, I think that is incorrect. I think that should be for the 21-22 school year. My apologies on that. I'll have to update the slides and send them to you again, Dan, because that's a, an error on that. Um, the data for Ontario, which if you look at it, is basically about a third of all of the students engaged in online learning in Canada is actually for the 2020-21 school year, even though the rest of the tables for the 21-22 school year. Um, so we're, you know, there's obviously going to be more students involved there. Um, oops, I went ahead too. But if you look at how that's actually, I'll go back to this one for a sec. So, um, the overall percentage involved, if you look at it, is seven point six percent. It's always interesting uh, to know what the national average is down here at the bottom. Um, so you can see those jurisdictions that are about at the average. Um, so places like um, Ontario, to a lesser extent Quebec. Um, you could um, make an argument for New Brunswick. Those that are well uh, above the average, uh, looking at Saskatchewan, Alberta, and BC, and then you can see Atlantic Canada and, and the territories for the most part, as well as Manitoba being well below that, that national average. Um, over time, you can see we've sort of crept up a little bit by little bit by little bit. Um, one of the things you'll notice in this is we had sort of a, a this period of almost a decade where we were somewhere between, say, 4.9 percent and 6 percent with, in most cases, a little bit of fluctuation. But you can see the numbers sort of growing a little bit most of the years. Um, you saw a big jump here in the essentially the first full school year after COVID hit. Um, but again, after you see that, again, you're starting to get into that point something increase that's happened. Uh, so we didn't see the same kind of jump in this most recent school year as we have from the first full school year under COVID. 
Um, and as you look at some of the, the jurisdictions, you can see where that increase took place. So if you look at Alberta as an example over the last four years, from 75,000 up into the high 90s um, in the last couple of years, um, BC goes from 65 down to 59. Then you see that first full year of COVID, you get that jump of um, 30,000 sorry, 25,000 students uh, there, and then back down to what would probably have been if you would erase this year and just do a regular line of slope. Most of these numbers over here are probably where they would be if you were to continue that line of slope and get rid of the data point for 2020-21. Um, and you see the same thing with the, the percentages. You know, if you look at Atlantic Canada, the percentages are roughly the same um, going through, you know, all within a, a, a percent of each other, a bit of growth in New Brunswick. But again, when you start looking at Alberta, B.C., uh, Saskatchewan, you can see, the, you know, a huge growth. Uh, four years ago, 4.5 percent, uh, up to 12.2 in the first full year of COVID, uh, back down to just over 10 percent now. Um, but you can see that sort of increase in all of those jurisdictions. The same, you see the big jumps in Alberta and BC, that first full year of COVID, and then back down to normal years. But if you look at sort of the trajectory, 10.6, 11.2, 12.5, you know, that's sort of a normal slope. 10.2, 10.8, 11.1, normal slope. Um, you know, so if you get rid of this one year here, you see it, it, it's had sort of that normal um, progress that you would expect to find. Um, one of the interesting findings that we had this year that really was new for us um, was the increase in the number of programs. This is actually something that we've never tracked before. Um, and the only reason that we did track it is because uh, when we were doing the data collection around Ontario, trying to find out uh, more information because we had that uh, deficiency coming from the, the ministry, um, we learned that there was a significant increase in the number of private online learning providers in Ontario. Uh, so 70 is, is basically looking at most of the school districts or school boards that were involved with maybe 10 to a dozen um, private based programs that were there. This increase that you see to roughly 250, that's not because there's any additional school boards involved. Um, the number of school boards involved from 2020-21 to 21-22 is the same. Now, many of them have increased what they're doing significantly, um, but the number of actual school boards participating is the same. So that increase of 170 or so, 180 or so programs, that's all private programs that are now operating in Ontario. Um, the other two jurisdictions that we thought were interesting, uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you can see, you know, we've had this initial gradual increase in Alberta, and then this past year we've had 10 more than there was the previous year. The same thing with Saskatchewan. We went from 15, 14, 16, you know, relatively stable number to another 10 and then another 10. Um, you know, and if you look at that's a two-year increase of, of over 100% uh, that we find here. Um, I've been referencing a lot of the stuff about the pandemic, and um, if you haven't checked them out, um, Randy and I, as well as a couple of other researchers uh, that can eLearn engaged with, uh, Joel Nagy, uh, Nagel was one of the, the, the main participants, um, uh, did this, what is it, seven report series, I think it is, um, on the um, each of the stages of the pandemic. Uh, so usually it was either at the beginning or the end of a particular school year, uh, starting off with, uh, well, there's a sort of an overview one, and then there's uh, the the spring 2021, and then um, one for each stage until we get to our sort of summary one, which uh, was published in both French and English. Uh, so if you haven't checked those out, uh, you should look at those because they do a really good job at sort of tracking what each of the provinces did and helping to explain some of what you're seeing and some of the general data that we're finding with online learning. Uh, this also does a much better job at looking at uh, what they did in terms of remote learning, which is something that we don't talk about in the report. Um, so we've only focused upon those established online programs, not the temporary remote ones that 
uh, are likely to disappear once the pandemic has um, ended, however it ends up ending. Um, so a couple of general trends that I want can, to touch can on. Can I jump in just before we sure. talk about you trends? There's a couple of questions that maybe you can help with in terms of data. So in, Wendy okay. was asking about Indigenous uh, program data from Nova Scotia. I did pop into the text chat uh, that we got the, uh, the the Manitoba. Sorry, I saw the, the MK was, uh, I read it as Manitoba briefly, Wendy. So um, so the in terms of Indigenous, because Kiwetna is also, we've had other individual programs listed from Indigenous. So maybe talk a little bit about that because we do track the federal, uh, which was where the report came from for a lot of the First Nations before. And now we're not getting it. So Yes, um, actually, that's a, a great question. So I'll actually head back to this one. Um, so basically, um, in the crowd changeover happens in 2018, 2019. Um, so there are four Actually, at the time, it was five um, Indigenous programs that we knew of across the country. Uh, but INAC also, as a part of uh, the funding that they provided um, through nominal role um, uh, data, tracked, actually, they had three categories. There were two categories related to online and distance, and then one category related to blended learning. Um, and they used to provide that data to us directly. Um, in 2019, they signed uh, agreements um, with various um, Indigenous organizations in Canada that essentially transferred the um, authority for education back to the individual bands. And as a sign of respect for their data, um, I, uh, I guess it's it's Indigenous Services Canada now, uh, so ICS um, doesn't provide that data for us anymore now. Um, we'd have to go to each of the individual uh, band councils to, to get that. Uh, so for the four programs that still exist that we are aware of, uh, and those would be um, the Wapaskawa Virtual Collegiate in Manitoba, the Kiwetinik Internet High School, in Ontario, um, the SC Cyber, it used to be called Sunchild, um, in Alberta, and then um, uh, I'm trying to remember what the fourth one is. It's in Ontario, it begins with an N, it's like Nisha or Nisha um, right. edu Distance Education Council. Uh, so those are the four that we've been able to, to track. And most of the data that we've been getting from them has been through the individual program survey. And one of the ways in which we've actually uh, come up with uh, these figures down here that we've gotten. Um, so the 2018, 2017, 2018 was the last year we got hard data from um, um it was indian affairs and northern indian and northern affairs canada um they um we take a look at the proportion of growth in the four programs that we know about year by year and use the baseline data that we had from the feds back five years ago and extrapolate what their growth in that data is likely to be assuming that the other programs are growing at the same level that the four that we're able to track are growing. So hopefully that answers the question. I'm not sure, uh, Dan, if the mics are on, that might be a time to kind of switch into that because I know that Connie had questions about trends and what's happening as well, so. Okay, uh, I think Wendy said that did answer her question. Okay. okay. Um, so the trends one, I think we'll probably get to that with with this slide here, Randy. Yeah, um, it's a little vignette that I just put a link into Key Wagner, uh in terms of, and it's a little bit older, but it does give you an idea in terms of the level of activities going on in, in that particular school. Yeah, and one of the nice things is the, the I can't remember if it was the first year or the second year that the, um, uh, that um, actually it was called ANSI at the time, Aboriginal Affairs in Northern Development Canada. Um, that they engaged us uh, in part of the data collection. We actually used a lot of the, the sponsors, 
uh, ship support that we got that year to uh, focus specifically upon the indigenous program. So if you go to that federal link, uh, which I think is if you go on the data and information, it's listed under uh, First Nations, uh, Métis and Innu. Um, is uh, FNMI, uh, I believe is how we've got yep. it labeled there. Um, yep. You'll see up. that there's a lot of vignettes. There's several brief issue papers. Uh, it's probably one of the most extensive individual jurisdictions that we've been able to highlight what's been happening on the ground. Um, uh, BC is probably the only other one that has the, the same sort of level of uh, information about it in terms of uh, you know project partners that we've had. Um, so in terms of uh, of, of the trends, um, in this past school year, one of the things that that we've seen the the most is is getting back to whatever that new normal is going to be. Um, so in terms of growth, in terms of participation, um, potentially in terms of the number of programs as we're seeing the online requirement in Ontario. Um, but we're also seeing some of the um, impacts of the pandemic as well. So because of the pandemic, everyone sort of knows what online learning uh, is, but that that or at least they have an awareness of what online learning is. Um, but as, as we indicate here, just because they 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 have an awareness of it doesn't mean they actually know much about it. And um, unfortunately, there's been a great deal of. Uh, um, misconception and, and a failure to understand the differences between remote learning that a lot of uh, parents and, and children experienced over the past couple of years and the traditional online learning that we've been tracking now for 15 years. Um, and unfortunately, it's um, many researchers in the field uh, confound those uh, two situations. Just about all of the media in the, uh, the that we have in Canada confound uh, remote learning and online learning. Uh, so there's a lot of heavy lifting to be done in terms of, you know, re-educating folks as to what uh, good online learning is and the fact that we've been doing it for, uh, you know, well over two decades throughout most of the country. Um, the other thing, and again, this is I would say a, a pandemic-related thing. Uh, although less so in Ontario, um, is that online learning is becoming more political. Um, online and remote learning got tied into, um, you know, the whole issue of response to the pandemic. And depending upon where your politics and ideology landed uh, around, you know, how much we should actually try to do something to, to mitigate this global pandemic, um, oftentimes dependent upon what you thought about uh, remote learning and school closures and and that kind of flexible learning environment that might have been created uh, in some of those contexts. Uh, I say Ontario is an outlier in that because they actually got about a year head start on everybody else when it came to getting more political because it was in March of 2019, so a full year before the pandemic, uh, that the Ford government um, came out with an announcement sort of out of the blue that said there was going to be four mandatory online courses or four online courses that would be mandatory for graduation purposes and that they were also going to go and centralize the entire online learning system. Uh, they've since, since walked back both uh, of those uh, quite a bit. Uh, the graduation requirement is now only two courses uh, and it's optional so parents can opt out of it and it's the only uh, apparently graduation requirement in the entire province that you can opt out of without getting the school's permission to do so. It's just uh, parents can just decide, I just don't want to do this for my child. Um, and they've also reined in the um, the role that the independent learning center is going to play as a provincial provider and are continuing to support and rely upon the school board uh, to run their own programs uh, at a significant amount. Um, the other thing that that we notice, and and it gets into the the regulatory environment, um, there were a number of provinces uh, from you know British Columbia who had been starting to um, revise their regulatory regime to Saskatchewan and Manitoba, who both had these ongoing uh, ministry level. Um, 
examinations is the word we use there, but um, basically some of them were called task force, some of them were, uh, you know, um, uh, called discovery um, sessions, um, but there were about five or six different provinces that had been sort of, you know, doing this navel gazing about online learning in their jurisdiction and what it should look like going forward. And most of those have concluded and they've started taking action as the 2021-22 school year was concluding. Um, and part of that action that they were taking in, in many cases was uh, towards a, a greater centralization of services or programs. Um, and so that's uh, one of the other things that we notice. Although there are outliers with this, and, and um, I'll mention Alberta as one of the main outliers, uh, both in terms of uh, you know they they have gone away from a more centralized model, um, and they were one of the ones that had concluded their um, their long term examination of of what they were planning to do long before uh, this particular school year. Yeah, I think there's a few folks in, in the crowd that might have some interesting insights to, to a few of that. So on because you ended on Alberta, we'll back up because Connie had a few questions about Saskatchewan as well. But Angelo, I don't know if there's anything that you want to add from your own perspective about what's going on in Alberta. And then Connie, a little, maybe a little bit uh, refining some of the questions that you had about Saskatchewan, which we can answer. Uh, for that, and then backing up into, of course, uh, David with asking about Manitoba. Just maybe we'll go backwards through that. And if anybody wants to ask a question about BC, Adrian, I'm not going to pin you down to have the answer to that question, but I will jump in on that. So why don't we, uh, Angela, go ahead. Hi, all. Uh, yes, for an Alberta perspective of things, I'm finding that uh, we're all standalone for each uh, division board. And what's happening with that is we're all using different learning platforms and it's hard to actually to work together. I know we have a moodlehub.ca website that actually helps other Alberta teachers to connect and actually have a meeting right away for that in the next 20 minutes. So I'll be joining that. Um, oh, but I'm, yeah, we're still doing that. Dirk is Meyer, Meyer is actually taking yeah. He had that server going and everything, but I'm regulating the meetings and so forth for that now. And I think this is one way best of networking. I know we have a blended conference we used to, but then I think that board just broke apart over time and um, Alberta. But then there's a BC blended version of things that you guys have, which is awesome because that's another way of networking when Western provinces and so forth. But it, it, I think we do need to have some united uh, vision of how it should look like for online learning, because I know some schools are doing so many different things when I talk to them and so forth, even like summer school, how we're running it compared to other school boards. It's just outrageous how some are doing synchronous, some are doing asynchronous, some are not even all on person and so forth. So it's there is no, I guess, same kind of uh, vision that we do have. But at the same time, if we all have the same vision all one way, then they might op open a new can of worms. So like I know BC can only has to use uh, a bright space or D2L like Ontario is. So that this is what's creating that whole um, limitation of exploring new learning management systems and so forth. Yeah, it's interesting as well, and I know the blended group is being rekindled to a certain extent because Terry uh, has taken a bit of a step back, but and Daylene is doing that through the book club, but they've also affiliated with Atlee, which is a tech conference that goes on in the fall as well, um, the same time as BCs are, are, are doing. So uh, you appreciate that. And Connie, I don't know whether you, with working in Alberta with some of the Alberta teachers, you have anything to add to that, but maybe you can ask your questions about Saskatchewan and then we'll move on east from there. Sure. Thanks so much, Randy and Michael, for your, you know, consistent effort to gather this information. So, so appreciated because without it, I mean, we wouldn't have even a good understanding at provincial levels even. So just, you know, kudos to your hard efforts because I know it takes a lot of time and effort to, to collate and get it and, and to continue, right? Um, so that aside, I was just wondering about, you know, like in Saskatchewan, I have heard rumors through students and just things that I've seen in the press that they are thinking about, you know, consolidating, going more to a centralized form of um, having um, 
the uh, you know online learning coming through the government more. Also, I think part of it too is that uh, they're also I think there there's so many uh, small school divisions in Saskatchewan that you know they have to look at efficiencies in different ways and um so you know i, I can see that you know it's, just, it's sort of like alberta broke apart and now saskatchewan's gonna you know pull together um in alberta i do think that part of what happened with adlc was actually uh around funding and it had to do it was around the politics of the financial agreements more than anything else it wasn't pedagogical it wasn't anything related Okay, this is from my sources. Okay, so the the unedited raw version was that it seemed quite around financial, political, you know, political kinds of things rather than from a pedagogical point of view. And uh, you know, it's hard to know. We are facing a new um, election here in end of um, May, and uh, you know, there's possibility because. It also relates back to um, open educational resources and the concept of sharing. But what Angela was saying about the different boards having different platforms, which makes it, you know, a challenge to um, to share. I do know that there's some movement through the Professional Development Consortium to have sharing sharing mm, happening, right? And uh, then, of course, through the government, they have their, I think they call them boards, which mm -hmm. are kind of like a curation tool. So there's different responses to it. It seems very mm, hit or miss from my point of view. There's no there's no good vision about, well, how could we get all of these players together to be more effective? So that's my perspective, and that's what I hear from students as well. And and also, to some degree, I believe in BC from this is what I hear from my grad students. But. So I, I'll come back to that as well. But I know over the past uh, couple of decades, I've seen Alberta go from central kaboom, central kaboom. <laughs> right now it's in kaboom. Um, but uh, it, but there is it, and often it's not, as you say, pedagogical or or, or logically done as, as sort of a transition. Whereas Saskatchewan, I think, is a little bit more deliberate in terms of centralizing uh, for that. But in Alberta, it is usually the the politics of people that uh, are are the issue uh, in terms of how these decisions come to be. Uh, but so in Saskatchewan, the one thing that's interesting as well is that they did have a centralized model and that just sort of dissipated what about three or four years ago mike actually it was no. uh, 10 years ago almost ten years. exactly okay 10 years uh I, i'm dating myself in terms of my memory um but uh what was interesting is it's a crown corporation that they set up uh, and then rather than reinvent which is ontario's role was going to have the ilc do it centrally they basically took an existing online program, which was pretty well spread throughout the province already, the SunWest uh, uh, DLC, and then they turned it into a Crown Corp in order to just adopt it uh, in that sense. So Darren Gasper, who did run the DLC and was superintendent of SunWest School District, has been seconded in to run the Crown Corp. So they are well on their way and they will be uh, launching in September. So they have uh, now working out partnerships with the different school divisions in the province uh, and they've got uh, set up also remote centers. Uh, I think it's 10 of them uh, across the province where there will be a school of, of sort of central record for the, the students in that general region to be able to come to if they need to uh, as well. But also they'll be having teachers uh, running and uh, working out of those centers as well in that regional context. So it's a really interesting model that I think is worth uh, taking a look at uh, somewhere down the road for that. But let's go to Manitoba before we go, because Manitoba also announced a, a, a nine, grade nine to 12 online central school. And I don't know, David, if you can give a, a, the latest sort of what's happening there, and perhaps Mike and I can chime in as well. Sure, yeah. Um, well, uh, as I was mentioning just before uh, the meeting started, you know, we're waiting on pins and needles to hear from our provincial lead, what the roadmap is, what the next steps are. Um, Michael had alluded to the K-8 um, remote learning 
service being discontinued uh, going forward. And that was in the papers just this past week. And that was followed by another story where there was parent involvement pushing to pushing back on that, wanting it to continue. Um, but what's going on here is that the government has announced uh, a desire to have a, a centralized service of sorts. Um, and I imagine, uh, and again, um, we're waiting on, on the announcement, waiting on the provincial leads um, recommendations and roadmap, but I imagine it's gonna be a pulling together of various components that are already existing. Um, again, uh, you guys were speaking to uh, the First Nation school that's in operation. Uh, I know that you're well aware of InformNet that's been operating in uh, Manitoba for a number of years. Um, so, of, of course, the First Nations has their own cultural and uh, their their own demographic that they they cater to. Um, InformNet provides asynchronous uh, uh, courses for both English and French immersion programs. And um, and then there's La Division Scolaire franco Manitoban, which has also had their own kind of a co-modal uh, type of uh, remote and, uh, and in-class um, uh, system going on because they have a, a lot of small francophone communities dis dispersed. So they'll have uh, maybe a, assemble a, a critical mass of 10 students to enable to, to you know, uh, some of the uh, courses in, in high school that they might not otherwise be able to offer for lack of uh, specialized teachers. Um, uh, so those are all kind of disparate components, and I, I'm not sure how they're all going to be assembled. Um, although, as it stands now, there is a distance learning unit in the ministry that uh, supports uh, course creation and provision of the uh, of D2L of Brightspace. So um, that I'm hoping mm -hmm. that will continue, or some form of that will continue. I, th I think they're getting well down the road as well. I know they say they did hire uh, Sukhan Dan, a retired superintendent, to be a part of that. Um, so that leadership is is is, is been created. Then similar is in Saskatchewan when they they seconded in Darren Gasper. So uh, those we try to stay in touch with them as well with through Canny Learn because uh, there's what we created Canny Learn for was that sort of national overview body that is independent of the. Um, you know, governments uh, in the sense that we ask for data and, and support from them, but we basically conserve the broader practitioner interests within the program levels is, is where we're, we've been looking as well. Um, so thanks. Uh, Mike, anything else to add in? And then I'm going to jump into BC. Uh, no, I mean, the only thing that just in response to one of the things Connie mentioned about, you know, the, the funding driving a lot of this stuff. Um, it, it's interesting because if you look at the current funding model that they've put in place in Alberta, and this is the reason I put the, the comment in there, um, and then there's a vignette that um, one of our Alberta partners wrote about funding. Um, the current funding model actually encourages districts to enroll students outside of their own district to the detriment of students inside of their district. Uh, so you can get more stable, you can plan for more stable funding based upon enrolling external students than you can plan on stable funding for internal students. Um, so it's it's a, a very interesting model with respect to that. And stay tuned because I'm sure it will change. <laughs> they do change the funding model quite often in Alberta. Yes. Um, so Adrian put in a link to uh, the, the, the first publication of what is now the implementation phase of what was announced probably almost three years ago in BC about the changes that they wanted to do coming in. Uh, and uh, the other thing that's interesting is we now they've now come down to uh, a list of and that's the list is on the, the site of schools. So there's 18 public online 
learning schools that can enroll students from outside of the the provincial or the, sorry their geographic school district boundaries. Uh, and there's 16 independent schools that have been online and doing this already enrolling students from across different jurisdictional areas in British Columbia. So they were all identified as provincial online learning schools. So BC was trying to consolidate things. What they basically did is, is eliminate the smaller programs, which were at the district level, uh, and then designated the, the larger programs that already had that geographic footprint across the province uh, for that. But they, they did this at, at, a, at a sort of a, a um, policy, not policy, so yeah, probably policy level is, is the best way at this point that they have to also uh, use the provincial learning management system. Uh, but in BC, the, the school districts have to pay per head that goes on to the LMS in terms of how they figured out that licensing. In Ontario, it's already paid for through the, the ministry uh, for any teacher to use or any school board or sorry, uh, district board. Uh, the other piece uh, is it's also there's an accountability and quality assurance model that they must adhere to uh, that is yet to be announced. So there's still a lot of details not put out and a lot of concern. Similarly in Saskatchewan, that dissemination is in, of engagement is happening and now it will start in Manitoba. But still there's in the Western provinces, I think there's a lot of uncertainty uh, and change that we'll start to see manifest and it may affect actually the number of students and or programs that uh, are, you know, in terms of the information. So it'll be interesting to see how many, what, what the next year uh, will, will bring in terms of the state of the nation uh, for that. So anything else that to add in there, Mike? No? No, no. Actually, the right. only thing I was going to say was what you ended with, whereas all the changes we're seeing in Saskatchewan, the getting rid of the elementary program in Manitoba, the new create, you know, the, the designation of either poles or doles in yeah, BC, yeah. that's all going to be in, in the 16th edition of the report because um, they're all mm -hmm. happening basically for this school year. Yes, that and then also the the implementation of the growth of what's happening with the mandatory in Ontario. So yeah. it's a very unique time to to be in looking at K-12 online in Canada. And I think we've got a lot more to say next next time, but uh, lots of speculation going on right now. So other questions? All right, got a hand raised. Have, Go ahead, David. David's got yeah. a hand yeah, I'm just wondering, um, uh, I caught some of your recording of the presentation in Austin uh, last week or the week before, yeah. and uh, one of your slides, Randy, was uh, the silos, <laughs> you know, and uh, and I've seen uh, similar slides before. So any indication anywhere in your studies and, and look across Canada of the breaking down of silos? And I mean, our our work is is the perfect medium for sharing right and and i think in terms of, i'm at le bureau de l'education française in the ministry in manitoba and so francophones for instance across western canada have a lot in common and would have a lot to benefit from sharing of resources programming even and and such so any indication of breaking down of silos I would say that, that there's been some dissipation of that in the past little while because I know the Francophone, uh, you know, online group got together on a regular basis and there used to be a ministry group that did get together back in the early days, but they decided that they weren't helping each other and they just stayed in their silos. But uh, maybe might, you might before you, I know you have to run, but maybe a couple of comments about uh, the work through because uh, CFED, uh, Jean Magrat, and, and others at C4 as well with uh, Cablefo uh, have had that connection uh, in the past with some folks in Saskatchewan as well as Manitoba. Yeah, and, and it was much better in the past because there used to be this, it's not really a group, it was more of a gathering called the Provincial Territorial Distance Ed Association um, that at one point in time was all of the ministry and department officials responsible for distance ed would get together and it was um, sort of an, uh, it, it was created originally as an offshoot of, of the Council for the Canadian Ministers of Education Council or Council of Ministers of Education Canada. Um, 
what ended up happening was in the last decade that it existed, um, really the Francophone providers had sort of co-opted the the group and you had very few ministry folks showing up but all of the francophone folks would be showing up um so it provided a good national venue for them to talk about you know the issues they were facing to be able to share resources to be able to to do some even planning across provinces um and we really haven't had that in the, the anglophone side um you know the the western canadian um course initiative that that um the WCLN? Yes, thank you. Western Canada Learn, uh, yeah, Learn, uh, CLN, um, Learning Network, yeah, as they call it. Yeah. But anyway, it is a consortium of course developer providers, uh, and now they've worked on Moodle. And I know with Dirk uh, Meyer in Alberta, he was part of that, uh, and it's also seen it some time at the Moodle Hub. But it, because there is no central provision of funding for that, it's a conglomerate kind of funding that comes into it. Uh, it has some connection across the provinces, but uh, it's probably the best example that's there. But it's very limited in terms of uh, the curricula courses and the sharing that is able to occur. Yeah, and that's about all that's happening on the, the Anglophone side, unfortunately. Um, you know, and it's a shame because there isn't that much difference in curriculum across the country. Um, particularly once you get outside of, say, the, the social studies and to a lesser extent, the English courses, because obviously in both of those, you like to have, you know, provincial examples that, that you can use in the curriculum. Um, you know, but the, the sciences and in particular the math, uh, I mean, are, are pretty much the same, right, you know, from coast to coast to coast. So why we can't have some sort of, you know, national repository for some of this um, really just depends upon the fact that, most ministries of education don't have the will to say we're going to cooperate with these other folks. Uh, they take the tack and, and I, I can remember one of them saying very specifically to me, this is paid for by the taxpayers of, insert province name here, so it's only going to be available to the taxpayers of, insert na province name here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. But content is one thing, and the other thing, I think, David, you raise a really good point around that. And we've got representatives of the Canadian eLearning Network uh, Board of Directors, um, but we really talk much more about research and common pieces that we can uh, sort through in that genre as opposed to sharing of, of resources uh, within. And I think it's more uh, what our focus is besides research is on practice. Um, so as opposed to curriculum and materials, uh, it's more about this is a good way in which there's some success. Here's some data that says this has happened. So we're staying in that area and not getting too specific to practitioner recommendations or practitioner uh, resources, uh, leaving that at the, the, the discretion of those uh, elsewhere. And so, I mean, Moodle Hub has some level of success in Alberta. But there's also other, uh, you know, school divisions that don't, aren't involved and in, and don't really need to or want to. They create and generate their own resources. So I don't know how to get away from reinventing the wheel, and but we do. And it's a little less siloed, but we still reinvent the wheel in all sorts of places. So sorry to, to end on that. I know that Mike, you have to drop off, and Dan. I yeah, I've got to drop off, but yeah. I want to let Dan close it before we yeah. do. Sure. Uh, yes. No. I just want to say thank you. Uh, Michael and Randy uh, for a, a great session. Uh, lots of information there. I do want to make sure that uh, people know that the recording will be posted in about an hour on the CIDER website, cideresearch.ca, and you'll find a set of the slides there and, of course, a link to the uh, report website as well, so you can catch up on all the documents there. Um, just personally, I, I you know, as someone who is caught up in the kaboom from de from centralized to decentralized in BC 20 some odd years ago. It's interesting to hear that that conversation is still going on, um, the struggle between the, the right way to do it. Uh, I, perhaps there will be no end to that. But uh, very interesting session and uh, thank you again. <laughs>